I said this in my book before I knew I was ever going to teach memoir is that admittedly politics has brought a lot of perks and you know and and some would say that that we deserve that as being a public figure or whatever and I never looked at it that way but by far it's it's the people that I got to meet through politics and I'm not just talking about it, famous people because we did but I'm talking about the people in our neighborhood that we talked about earlier I'm talking about people that voters that I called I mean if if you're not a, in, involved in politics to the extent we were you might not be calling voters and hearing about their lives and stuff so in just the way it is now it's it's people but in a different way that that I've enjoyed um interfacing with since becoming an author and you know if I can help someone else you know do what I was able to do then okay everyone welcome back to living the next chapter we're going to take you for a trip okay so I'm in Canada and we send our best Canadians down to this very very popular place where they're treated like royalty by some of the nicest people in the world and one of those nicest people in the world has a very interesting story to share with us today. Uh, she has done some interesting things within her family, with her husband, and she also can help you write an amazing memoir. So <laughs> Carrie Kreisman's here with me. Carrie's here to talk about her journey as an author, and she wants to help you on your journey as an author as well, Carrie. Welcome to Living the Next Chapter. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And I'm looking forward to talking and, and enjoying the conversation. It's great. Now, I mentioned we send our best Canadian people down to your folk, <laughs> down in your part of the world. Tell everybody where you are. I am in St. Petersburg, Florida, and actually live about 10 minutes from the beach. So, uh, you know, Canadians are uh, sharing our roads and um you know, uh, giving our economy a boost. We love our Canadian visitors, and, and that is the truth. Some of our very best friends um, are from Canada originally. Um, like I mentioned uh, once before, possibly, when you and I have had the opportunity to chat, um, some good friends from um, St. Catharines and um, Toronto area, and we've enjoyed visiting uh, your country and Montreal and Quebec, you know, and city and stuff. So, you know, the feeling is mutual and, and uh, we love our Canadian visitors. We're happy that we can be a respite um, maybe for the winter. Um, I've, I wouldn't know what that's like. I've visited, but I always know that I can come home and I've never had to shovel snow to get on, um, get my day started. No, <laughs> so. Yeah. It's can get, it can get kind of cold up here, but um, yeah. there's something also special about St. Petersburg, Florida, and that mm -hmm. you and your family have a very unique tie to the city. Can we talk a little bit about that? I'm pretty interested to sure. share that with everybody because it's kind of the basis of your book, right? Sure. Yes. Well, I, I'm a St. Petersburg native, which is a little rare, you know, I think for at least older people, you know, to be from here and born here. I've lived here virtually my whole life with the exception of one year of college. And then I returned to finish my uh, college education at University of South Florida. But beyond that, um, my husband was the mayor for eight years from 2014 to 2022. And it was something that um, we never envisioned. And I know that a lot of our lives will take turns that we didn't plan. So that's not unique, but it was certainly never part of the conversation when we met, when we got married, even within the first um, five years of our marriage. Um, and it, it just was somebody... A uh, good friend, I like to say, and it's in the beginning of my book, and the description is um, my book, Accidental First Lady, on the front lines and behind the scenes of local politics. Mm. Well, how it starts out is that a friend of ours who lived in the neighborhood called and said, hey, I got a question. Can I come over? And we're like, sure. It was a Sunday night, nothing going on. We had a, a one and a half year old and um, almost one and a half and our firstborn daughter, Jordan. And uh, so we said, sure. So we open a bottle of wine, sit down at the kitchen table. And our friend says, I think you should run for city council. He says that to my husband. And it was something we had never thought of. We were faithful voters. Uh, you know, we always voted in elections. And you know, ironically, when my husband and his friend Lars, who posed this question, were in their mid-20s, 
my husband ran Lars's first political campaign and they lost. <laughs> so, <laughs> not that that has anything to do. I think it has more to do with that. It was a first campaign for 20 somethings, you know, novices running this. But with that said, our friend had served, uh, you know, like a dozen years or so in, in the uh, state politics. So now he figured he'd, you know, hit up his good friend and, and see about uh, serving on city council. So we thought it over for a few days and um, kind of jumped in. It's it's that old adage, you don't know what you don't know. And I yeah. think if you if you knew some of the things about any situation, maybe you wouldn't do it. So it's a little, there could be benefits to jumping in a little blindly, if you will. Um, but we did it and we were complete novices. Um But, you know, for and it was a short campaign. The this was January. The election was in March. So we had two months to tell the district uh, and the city, because it's a citywide election, even though he represented a district and um, who my husband was, introduce him to the people and the voters of St. Petersburg. So so we did our best. We had twenty five dollar ahead wine tastings at our house to raise money. I licked envelopes during the weeknights after our daughter went to bed. I don't know that we're many people are doing that now. I yeah. think campaigns still send out mail, but it's usually a card or, um, you know, by text even, you know, campaigning has really evolved with um, technology and social media. But yeah, we, we hit the ground and did the best we could. But the he lost that first race. He got 42% of the vote. But what he gained was... Um, the bug, if you will, um, he he wanted to serve, and so he became involved in in city government through committee work and and through a series of events, which is what happens. It's like a domino effect. It one person might resign to run for another seat, which leaves it open and a special election, if you will. So, all told, he served six years on the Saint Petersburg City Council, then ascended to the state house, which is um, in in the uh, in Florida. Our legislative sessions are 60 days. Um, They're usually March through May, but now they alternate. They go January through March one year, then March through May another year. So he was a state house rep for six years and then uh, took a couple of years off, maybe about a year or two, and then decided to uh, run for mayor. So as he was ascending this political ladder and really getting involved um, you know, our family was changing. We, our son was born five years after our daughter was, uh, you know, the life changes were happening, you know, just what would happen in the course of anyone's life. And meanwhile, we're living this increasingly public life and adjusting as we go. There's really no political playbook for spouses. Mm, um, right. In, you know, a politician, especially, on the state level or higher is generally going to have some sort of team, not necessarily for city council, but definitely the, the more prominent offices. And not that he had someone telling him everything to say and what to do, but he had handlers. He had people crafting a message and, and a team working with him. Well, you know, in terms of my message, because if they, they can't talk to the candidate or the elected official, who do they want to talk to next? the spouse, if there's a spouse or significant other. Mm -hmm. And that was me. So I was, whether it was car line, the grocery store, uh, the gym, any, you know, anywhere, you know, church or or what have you, you know, if, if someone wanted to know something about how he was going to vote or, you know, what he was going to run for next, (laughs) you know, that's a popular question. They, they asked me and I had to kind of learn on my own how to navigate these waters and, as someone who, you know, I embraced the life because it supported him. And, you know, as a couple, we've always supported each other with with our endeavors and what we want to do. So if it was me by myself, I don't think I would have chosen it. But after about 17 years, it took that long, people finally started asking in earnest, how do you do this? As in, how do you live this public life? Like with raising your kids. And I think that timing was significant because U.S. politics was becoming more vitriolic and, you know, just really tough to engage in meaningful conversation with people who think differently than you. And it would create, you know, a lot of strife where people that maybe weren't so political 
were engaging or were at least aware. And it made people sit up and take notice of how it might affect the family or a marriage or raising your children when they see things online or the news and what have you. So I was having coffee with a friend um, after my husband's eighth and final election. It was for his second term as mayor and he won, but it was it was a very decisive, uh, not decisive, divisive race in the city. And um more so than other ones. It was the most expensive race in the city, which that's another story about why politics is so expensive and, you know, shouldn't be, but that's, that's another topic for another time. But when I gave my friend the answer to how do you do this? um, She, you know, we were one-on-one sitting across each other, having a coffee. I wasn't rushing through the grocery store, telling a stranger something it was a heartfelt answer and with someone I could trust. And she said, wow, you should write a book. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I had never thought of writing a book. I've been a writer for my job. Uh, You know, as a, I was a PR manager at a local nonprofit. Before that I worked in marketing for our city's newspaper. So I always wrote in some form or fashion for my job, but I'd never thought of, of writing a book. And and there, you know, that day in that coffee shop, accidental first lady was born. <laughs> the idea. Wow, I like this. Okay, uh, so the one thing, like you go from happy household, kind of under the radar, just like all of us, kind of doing your daily day to day, and then the moment you decide as a family, as a couple, to put yourself out there, to step into leadership and put your name out there, then mm-hmm. the scrutiny comes. Then yeah. the cameras turn from others to your family and to you mm-hmm. guys. And I just think in all of the political talk that we have in Canada and in the in the U.S., that mm-hmm. we sometimes forget about the family. We forget about right. the people behind behind the scenes who support mm-hmm. who support their loved one as they serve. And I I do see, even here in Canada, where they say we're really polite people, I do see like news agencies going after families. Mm-hmm. I see cameras in the bushes. I see gotcha pieces right. and all this stuff, you know, and then mm-hmm. I just wonder how, how that filters into the home when you shut the yeah. doors at night and everyone's home, there's, there's mm-hmm. your kids, there's your relationship with your husband. Mm-hmm. You know, you hear these things that come at you from, from the outside world into your home. Right. How did you filter that? How did you keep distance and keep your, your home different from the job? It It's hard because we had to make a concerted effort, especially as our kids got older and could be part of the conversation. You know, and I think it's great to have serious conversations and talk about politics with your children. And, you know, because that in, it engages them so that they will hopefully become civically minded and want to care about their community and things like that. But when it is personal to you, um, we would have to make an effort around the dinner table to not make what their father did um, and what might have been said that day or what was going on, you know, at that particular time that was maybe a a stress point or big decision-making opportunity coming up. The the focal point, you know, um, you know, I had my interests and, and my life apart from his politics. The kids certainly did school, sports, what have you, you know, what most families engage with. So we would have to, because it's easy to just continually go down that rabbit hole. And then that's all you talk about because it's, it is, it can, it's be all consuming, especially his um, position as mayor. It, um, of course he slept, but it was truly a 24 seven job. You know, there was never a vacation that we didn't take where I mean, we had a great time, but there was always that thought that if there's something significant that happens at home, this could be cut short for, you know, because he's he was the the top, it, you know, from yeah. where everything yeah. flowed. And he knew that going into the job. But with that said, you know, that put our family on a greater, um, you know, uh, plane, if you will, of public service and public awareness of who we were. You know, there was... Uh, the one of the most surprising things that and you know as much as you think you know or how many years you've been in it you're always surprised the day he was being sworn in January 2nd 2014 we're up in his new office greeting 
some of the what would be his cabinet, you know, when he starts two hours later yeah. in his job after the swearing in. And it's it was almost a receiving line of sorts. And I had no idea that there would be um, police that would be covering him all the time when he went out in public. Um, I had one that seemed to think that she was going to be uh, covering me, so to speak, not everywhere I went, but this constant keeping in touch kind of thing. And thankfully, that didn't come to fruition because I didn't need that. But there were certainly times when, you know, for various reasons um, and good for us that we didn't know about most of them. He had a police uh, chief that he trusted implicitly and um, and his uh, staff underneath him that if there was a reason for a police car to be stationed in front of our home, then that was good enough. We didn't need to know what the threat was or, or why necessarily, but it's, it was a little unnerving at times, you know, that your children walk out front, you know, to, (laughs) to go get in the car or something or their friends pick them up. And it wasn't, didn't happen all the time, but it was certainly moments where, where it happened or that, you know, I'd get a call in the middle of the day. Um, they're just going to take a few pass throughs the neighborhood. So if you see them, don't be alarmed and that kind of thing. And you, you just kind of assume all that and you take it all in and you don't really realize how it's affecting you and that everything with regard to that level of office, the mayor of a city is, is so all encompassing and how it really does affect the whole family and yeah. and impact everyone. So we did the best we could because I would always tell my husband back when um, he first started and was really getting into politics more and more. I said, you know, to keep it real, I said, you know, we need to take care of this. We have two children, you know, and and we need and our marriage and. Because once politics is gone, this is what is left. Right. Politics won't be around forever. Yeah. And, um, you know, so and there's certainly ways to navigate it and make it a positive experience. And I think we did. I mean, on the flip side of having the police at your house or, you know, negative comments and things like that are the in, invariable perks that do come sometimes with public office, special opportunities, getting to meet celebrities occasionally. And we tried to keep it real with our kids, you know, and just say, look, I would joke when they were little, like, we are only getting to do this because of daddy's job. If this was, if he did anything else, we wouldn't be meeting so-and-so or being able to do just to keep it real because then there can, especially with a child, there could be an expectation that this is my life. This is what is afforded to me and what I expect. And we did not want to raise children with that, um, that, that, uh, what's the word, not expectation, but feeling like they were, you know, deserving of yeah. something special. That entitlement, right? So, Just with the time. Entitlement. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what right. I was yeah, looking yeah. for. Good. Thank so, you for pulling yeah, there that you out. Go. I love it. So <laughs> what about like, just, I'm, tr- I'm trying to picture just your neighbors. Okay. Like you mm-hmm. have the neighbors to the left and right of you across the street, uh, people you would see day to day, way before mm-hmm. any of this was a reality for your family. Uh, mm-hmm. I might be your neighbor and had borrowed your lawnmower and never brought it back because I'm a bad person uh, and it's in my garage or in my, in my house. Um, yeah. People go from being neighbors with you and knowing your family the way you were prior to all of this. Right. And now you're the neighbor who's the mayor. And that's a different thing, right? Yeah. Did, your, yeah. did, the, did that kind of dynamic change just in your local community uh, around your around your home? It changed a little bit, but not tremendously. We've lived in the same space, different houses, you know, for various reasons. We've built a new house 15 years ago, but um, 30 years almost this year, 30 years. So we've been here a while. And, you know, they were always dialed in to him running because it was in the news and would see the signs or, you know, in the yard or whatever. And thankfully, we have a, a, a diverse relatively diverse neighborhood compared to some others and politically also because um you know it's no secret that you know several years ago Donald Trump was our president and our neighbors next door had a Trump sign while we had a Biden sign mm-hmm. and we still chatted around the lake while we walked our dogs Good. and See? you know they didn't and plus our politics were not a secret 
you know, not you don't know everyone's politics, right. but because my husband, even though the mayor's position is nonpartisan, when you're voting, you're still voting with a somewhat partisan because of it's your values and right. what you believe. So yeah. with that said, he wasn't running as a Democrat or a Republican, but people knew his his politics. So but no, and that's a part of a, a bigger conversation that we try to share with our kids when, you know, going back to the previous um, question you were asking about the kids is that, you know, it, the biggest part of, of politics and is is being able to have conversations with people who are different than you. And it really showed our kids how politics can work because, you know, people who think differently than us, you know, about certain things still could support my husband or not for mayor. And, and, and that, while we wanted every vote, that was okay. It's simply not going to happen. Just the same as we can have engage in a nice conversation with our, our neighbors that we know are voting for the other candidate that we wouldn't vote for yeah. and, and be okay about it. Um, you know, and, and, when you stop being able to talk to someone who thinks differently than you, then that's not good for, you know, yeah. the community. It's not good for anything, but our neighbors for the most part were, they, they didn't, we have dogs and most of the time if we're out walking our dogs, someone else is walking their dogs. So what are we going to talk about? Usually the dogs. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> thankfully for, for the dogs, it wasn't always politics first. And, um, but I think people are just generally, we're lucky to live in a neighborhood where they're just generally nice, you know, and they're not going to, you know, badger us about something. Um, there's been a couple times where someone might have come to the door to ask a question about something, but never, never in a intrusion type of way. Um, and so we've been very lucky about that, you know, yeah. for that. Yeah. So like my wife and I opened a small little business a few years ago. And I remember driving up to it about 10 minutes before the, the day to open the store. And mm -hmm. standing in front of the store <laughs> was the mayor of our city. Yeah. Uh, he just wanted to check out our new store. Mm -hmm. And That's there he nice. was standing there. And so yeah. I come up to the door and I'm like, I, 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 and I'm not, I don't, I've never talked to him before in person, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm like, I don't know how to address him <laughs> properly. <laughs> like I'm going through my mind all the things as I walk up to yeah. this the mayor standing there right mm -hmm. and uh he's like can i come in and see your new store and i'm like don't you have a key because <laughs> right. you're like the mayor <laughs> don't you have a key to everything right he's yeah. so he laughed he thought that was funny yeah um, but i didn't even know what to call him he's like my name is walter and i'm like yeah okay you're you're a human mm -hmm. right and i just kind of take right. a big well, breath exactly. right and i think yes. we forget we forget mm -hmm. some of that he came in he yeah. talked to us he, he encouraged us as a small mm -hmm. business and he just yeah. kind of poured into us and yeah. in that moment it didn't matter anybody's political beliefs didn't matter mm -hmm. any of that stuff but here is someone with a title right who mm -hmm. cared about somebody that he had never met before but showed yeah. interest in us and i just mm -hmm. walked away from that experience going that is like the best the best experience yeah. ever to have mm -hmm. a someone recognize you as a member mm -hmm. of the community but b right. that i got to have interaction with someone who didn't yeah. have people around him, who didn't have, yeah. you know, handlers. And mm -hmm. later on, I was able to interview him for one of my podcasts. Everything yeah. fell apart in the video recording. And he's like, yeah. he's looking over at his people. He's like, can somebody help me here? He's like, yeah. he's like, David, I'm just <laughs> going to give you my email address. And you and I are mm -hmm. going to do this ourselves. They're, they cool. can't help right now. So right, the two right. of us then got to do something together without his team mm -hmm. because nice. we had a bond, right? And I just, yes. I just think that as... As community members, if we can remember at the end of the day, our leadership in our communities are human beings mm -hmm. who go home, take off their shoes, sit down, flip on the television, walk their dog, yeah. um, you know, play with the kids. Mm -hmm. We're all humans at the end of the day. And we That's need to right. treat each other with an elevated respect level mm -hmm. because they're there to serve. That's the exactly. big part of what they do. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. one thing I walked away from with that interaction is that yeah. this is a real person. And right. they demonstrated care and concern for me. And I was like, yeah, what an awesome experience. And that's what they should do. I mean, and not not everybody who's elected does that and wants to. But my husband was that kind of mayor because he truly loved the job. And the flip side of that is that, yes, the elected officials 
are human and people need to remember that and with families but and but the people who are elected are also elected to serve so basically you're you are your mayor's boss <laughs> in a way because he is he or she is serving your community and you know and and that's that should be top of mind and so i think that's wonderful that you know your interaction with the mayor and and how they were supporting your small business and you know cuz i believe small businesses are the backbone of communities there's a place for certain types of businesses in all cities but definitely the small businesses and the people who live there and have lived there for years and it's important when elected officials can honor that and and in the end we are all people with feelings and you know and and just to remember the the people behind the the title or the you know the posi- the people behind the position if you will and and I think a lot of that gets lost sometimes I like to call them keyboard cowards, the trolls online, you know, when when they say things and, and you know, spout off whatever they don't, they're not held accountable to anyone. And, you know, and that's the shame of it. There's social media is is wonderful for so many purposes, but, you know, and then that's where continuing to have conversations in real time with face to face, if you can, with people is really what's going to save us, I think, you know, and, and be willing to talk about, you don't have to change someone's mind, but at least just talk to someone. I, I love hearing my son tell me, um, a friend that he, they met in preschool and then hooked back up in high school to become friends and they're still friends, but they are decidedly of a different way of thinking politically. And, but he'll, he'll tell me sometimes, Luca and I had this great conversation about blah, blah, blah. And we talked and, you know, and they're 21 and doing this. And I'm like, if, if all of you can do this, it can maybe help heal the divide of politics that's happened. Because what happens is that, is that people become disenfranchised and then they don't want to vote. And I think voting is something that you should never take for granted, no matter what party, because it was so hard fought and, yeah, you know, so that's yeah. just you know, we're a little off topic. No, but. it's good. I love this. It's a great conversation. <laughs> so, so, okay, my name, the name of my podcast is Living the Next Chapter. So I have to ask mm-hmm. for you yeah. and your family, what's your next chapter now that that you guys have made a change? What's going forward for you and your your husband and your family? Well, he finished officially um, 2022. January 6, 2022, was his last day of being the mayor of St. Petersburg. So. He has been out of politics for two years. And so he has another job, which he loves. Um, you know, nothing could top being mayor. He truly, truly loved that job. But this, he loves this one almost as much, I believe, because he gets to interact again with people and help other people be successful through his position. And so for us, we are not a political family anymore, but we do try to support candidates that we believe in when we can. Um, through our platform, because, you know, my, the title of my book, Accidental First Lady, the accidental, you know, and so I've had some people ask sometimes, well, why? And I said, because it's a life I never envisioned. And the title of First Lady, I mean, the night that he got elected mayor in 2013, I'm getting texts, congratulations to the first, the next First Lady of St. Petersburg. And I'm, I had to laugh. I was <laughs> like, Wait, what? I was like, seriously? <laughs> I think it, there's one first lady, you know, and yeah. that's the president's wife, if you know, or maybe the governor's wife or spouse, you know. Um, but in terms <laughs> of a city, first lady, and then I over the years, because he served for eight years, I it was a term of endearment kind of, and I stopped laughing when people would say it because I thought, you know what, if they th- are kind enough to think that about me. I would always say, call me Carrie, you know, I mean, it was never like Mrs. Christman, you know, or whatever, but, um, but, but it's still, it was, it was nice, but, you know, in terms of, we have a platform, that was my point in getting to that, whether, you know, I wanted to believe it at first as the spouse of a, a mayor of a, the Florida's fifth largest city, if you want, you can have some sort of a platform where people will look to you and want your opinion on things. And so it took a little bit of getting used to, but now that I'm happy to share that, if I'm asked, I'm happy to share. And so I'm happy to support 
when I can other political candidates and be okay about doing it because he's not in office where it would affect him in any kind of way. Um, you know, I uh, have enjoyed the post-publication phase of my book. It it was uh, published in October of 2021 and by a local press, St. Petersburg Press. And what was so wonderful about that is that you know, they've got at least 36 books, I think, now that have been published by local authors, local stories, and and so forth. And what's been unexpected for me in a good way is the community that comes, if you want it, with being an author. Um, you know, the day my book came out, I believe, I or a few days after, I had another local author who I'd never met, but we followed each other online, message me and say, hey, would you like to meet for coffee? I've got some great ideas if you want to hear them about marketing your book, you know, because she knew I was new and she's published several books and, and you know, it was things like that. And, and then since this, we've I've done events with different local authors. I've had coffee with up and coming authors who want to publish their books. I've tried to pay it forward. And, you know, we all want to sell books. We all want to find some success in, in our own way. But it's not competition. It's collaboration mm -hmm. over competition. And it really just makes it, I believe it makes it better for everyone, you know, when, you know, there are opportunities to share. And so what that has led to is is teaching memoir and, and teaching it from a perspective of an average person who wrote their book. Um, and when I say average, I mean, I don't have a huge platform with hundreds of thousands of followers. I am not a nationally known name. I'm well known in my area, but I still would have been probably because I've lived here my whole life, even if my husband wasn't elected, yeah. you know, I, I just have lived here forever. And that's just how it goes. But outside of that, I, you know, I'm just an average person who wanted to write a story and, and publish a book and I did it. And there's a lot of people out there that want to do it. And when I was first writing, I know this is what many authors or aspiring authors feel is, does anybody care? Will anybody besides my family and friends read my book? And, you know, I got to the point where I want to publish my book and I'm not going to worry about who's going to read it at this point. But then, of course, you want to sell some books and 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 do that. And the truth is that no matter who you are and of you obviously, it goes without saying you have to have a well-written, well-edited book, a nice product, but there are going to be people who want to hear your story. There are. I mean, walk into any bookstore, books line the shelves. Libraries are popular, thank goodness, because libraries are so important in our communities. But every Tuesday is publication day for new authors. There are new books coming out all the time. So somebody will read your story and your story has value and is worth telling. And I, I truly believe that with all my heart. And when someone asks me what I asked people when I was starting to write, should I do this? Should I write it? You know, I said, you know, if it's in your heart, then you absolutely should do it. And I'm stealing a friend's words, but that's what she told me. And that's what I believe. And so I tell um, others that when, when they ask or if they ask, but it, it led me to, to, teach others how to do it, you know, uh, how to get started, how to overcome imposter syndrome, how to find your unique topic, because we have, we all have a bank of memories and ideas and things, but memoir isn't necessarily, it's not your whole life story. It's a period of your life. It can be a year in your life, depending on what you're telling. And so um, it comes in all different forms. If, if, any of it is anyone who's listening or you yourself have read memoirs, they're, they're different and cover different time periods. There's different paths to publishing uh, and no one right path for anyone. And, um, and I think any author can be successful, whether they choose to publish, self-publish on Amazon or hire a company where they pay a little, not a little, but pay some money into it in return for having the published product, um, or they get a deal uh, with an agent and a publishing company. So there's there's pros and cons to each path, but you know you can find one that fits for you. Um, and the other thing is marketing. You know it, that's something that authors they've spent all this time writing, and it can be daunting to <laughs> you know think about now I have to market this book, and 
I mean, some authors write just to write, maybe for family legacy or for their own purpose and don't ever want to maybe sell a book. But I believe that most authors, if they're going to take the time to write a book and, and have it published, no matter the means, they they want to be able to market it, and, but they don't know how. Um, and there are easy ways to do it, or maybe they don't have a budget for marketing. And there's definitely ways you can do it without spending a dime. Um you know, to publish. So I try to, you know, tell cover all of that, you know, and that's a lot. You could break it all down into one comprehensive course, but, you know, different components of it. But it's a big overview of what what I teach and, and try to inspire others. It's great. So we're your new class joining joining you. You have an update. You said you're something exciting is happening for you about teaching all of this amazing mm-hmm. stuff about writing memoirs. We're all gathered here in the classroom. We've all sit, sat down. You've walked into the classroom, and you're going to talk to us day one about mem- mm-hmm. writing your memoir. We're, we have our we have our blank piece of paper and a pen in our hand. We're waiting to hear what's going to come mm-hmm. from you to us as new authors. What would be kind of like your first tip, you would say, your first starting point for all of us gathered today, eager to write our memoir? Where would you? Where would we start? Uh, I think the first place I would start is not necessarily with the writing, but with the mindset um, of of getting over those limiting beliefs that an aspiring author can have. That, again, like I just said, that my story doesn't have value. Nobody cares. Nobody's going to want to read it. You you can't begin to write what you can, but I don't think the writing will be as effective if you're constantly writing with this, no one's going to read this and this is terrible. And who am I to even be doing this? That is a common belief system. There's also um, perfectionism that can get in the way. Um, Maybe you're not a perfectionist in your daily life, but perfectionism can show up in other ways that maybe you might not look like a perfectionist, but it can show up in ways that you think, that can keep you from accomplishing something. Um, There's a concept of writing. um, There's different words that can be used to describe the draft, but I'm, you know, for the sake of um, this program, I'm going to say a terrible first draft rather than another word that could be used. Um, (laughs) The the idea is to, to write freely and, and be able to write so that you can come back to it and, get everything out and then pare down, but the, you know, get over the limiting beliefs and believe that you can do it and that your story has value. That would probably be the, to set the stage and what I would want people to believe in themselves before we even talk about writing. And then I would probably go into, um, some people may come already knowing their story that they want to tell, like what their book is. And some may not know. And that's where I would suggest a writing prompt or, you know, just taking some time to go for a walk, move your body, which can unearth memories. And, you know, I'm not an expert in that. I've just found that, you know, getting up out of the seat when you're staring at a blank screen and trying to figure out what to say, you know, moving your body, take your phone or take something with you because you're going to have ideas will help. And, um, and you never know that what stories might come out of, you know, something you think you might write about, And then you remember something else that that's the real story. Like a writing prompt can ask you, make you ask yourself a certain question, but your answer to that question may not be your book, but in thinking of how you're answering that question, you might be led to different memories that unearth the real story that you want to tell. There's also techniques, interview yourself, Um, You know, and it causes you to so many times we're looking forward and at what's right in front of us that we forget about certain memories and things, um, you know, that that could be that could be the book, because there are people that say, I want to write a book, but they truly don't know what their story is. I knew what my story was, but it it evolved like my story started out as a how to book for political spouses. And the more I wrote, I found that if I was going to give anyone advice, my advice was kind of going to generally be the same, like carry yourself well, you know, make sure communication is paramount with your spouse and your family. You know, my answer to every situation kind of was, so then I also thought, 
who am I to be giving someone advice? Like if someone comes to me and asks me, but in a book form, you know, how to live their life. Like I would approach a situation in one way, how I believe, but just because another person does, doesn't make it wrong. And so that's how my book evolved. So, but I had to do that before I could do that. I had to get it. I had to write. And I wrote a good amount, not a lot, but I wrote at least maybe three to four chapters before I realized my book needs to go in a different direction. So, you know, abandon the limiting beliefs, believe in yourself and believe that your story has value, then start writing. I love it. And so I'm on your website while we're chatting. Okay. Um, I love your website, by the way. There, oh, I thank see, you. I see it the way we can unlock your memoir and grab mm-hmm. a free guide can you tell us what, what do we get when we sign up to unlock our memoir? That is uh, my list of 10 writing prompts. Good. And so, uh, you know, that's, uh, it's been pretty popular. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with that because it, what it says to me is that for a, a good amount of people that a writing prompt can be valuable when you're just beginning. And, you know, you say, some might say 10, that's it. Well, if it said 300 writing prompts, I might be overwhelmed. And I know there's there's books out there, those those calendar a day type of things you can rip off and have a quote a day. And I think those are great and have a purpose. But for someone who's new and just getting started with this writing process, I think 10 is is a good is a good way, a, a good amount. And they're diverse also. So I think it it get and if if maybe that's maybe they don't find one of the ones that that speaks to them in there it might spark something else so that's what that is it's a free guide and um you know if if you want the guide um, in all transparency you just give your email and then you you're on my list and and I send articles that I I believe are helpful I send weekly blog posts and you know I I I bring you into my community yeah. and so you know that way it's amazing. So, okay, Carrie, tell everybody your website address because I'm looking at it right now. I love it. Um, send Thank us, you. send everybody there, and maybe beyond the unlocking your memoir, um, your free guide. What other things should we kind of take note of on your website as well? Sure. Um, well, my website is CarrieChristman dot com, and it's K E R R Y K R I S E M A N dot com, and. Uh, you know, I've got the free writing prompts, which is right on the homepage of my website. But I have a I have a resources page also with some other uh, writing resources that I've created, and and anyone is welcome to go take a look. I'm I'm on Instagram at Carrie author, and so uh, you know sometimes I'm, I'm coming on there with tips. I try to provide value, you know, with with writing prompts. I give a little glimpse into my personal life because we always want to know the person behind the, you know, the the the, the not facade, if you will, yeah. but the 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 <laughs> platform yeah. person behind the yeah. platform. I'm sorry, and um, you know, but I'm on, you know. Some of us prefer different social media sites. I'm on LinkedIn. If you're the type of person that likes to be on there as well, I'm, I'm on there. Carrie Kreisman. I have a Facebook group um, called Make Memoir Magic. It's a new and growing group, but it's an inclusive space for uh, aspiring writers, um, published authors, anyone who's who's interested in writing. And, you know, I... I Sometimes I'll go on Facebook Live. Come, I'll come on. I'm, you know, it's a place for people to also share if they've written something. That's a place for them to share it. Um, it's a place for for questions and and just you know engagement with with the writing community online. And so that's just another way to keep up. But um, definitely, uh, you know, you can subscribe to my newsletter. I do a monthly newsletter also which has been around since my book came out. So that's more of a general type of what's going on with me. I try to share information, not just about myself, but maybe about another author who might have something coming out or something that's top of mind, you know, in the world, you know, not to get too heavy, but just I try to keep it a little, um, you know, creative with with what I'm sharing rather than all about me, 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 (laughs) you know, because and so but that's my monthly newsletter. But if you you know, like if you download my writing prompts, then, you know, I'm going to send you a weekly blog post that, um, 
you know, it's quick too. It's yeah. not a cumbersome newsletter and it can hopefully provide some value and inspiration and um, help you along the writing journey. So whatever, if you want to do all of them or whatever speaks to you, but just uh, I'd love to have you in my community. Excellent. A lot of great resources. Um, Carrie, I think we can we can give you a new title now. Okay. From <laughs> Accidental First Lady to Purposeful First Lady oh. of Memoirs right here. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and author support and on and on it goes. I, I think you've 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 moved past that accidental part and now I see mm -hmm. you living that purpose driven, supportive yeah. role for authors mm -hmm. in your community. Um I see everything that you're doing you're doing today. You you do have a focus, you have a purpose, and you are helping people. So thank you. So there you go. You're still the first lady. But in a different <laughs> context now, which I like. Right. So yeah. Really appreciate you doing this, Carrie, and being awesome. being on the show and talking about your journey as an author and how you help people. And I'm excited that people can now come and find you and be part of your community as well, just by hearing you here on the podcast. All right. Well, thank you. And thanks for having me. I've really enjoyed the conversation and and the opportunity to to talk about what I do and and where I came from, <laughs> you know, it, it's been a journey, just like the writing journey, this whole political journey. And you know, if if I can say one thing is is um, I said this in my book before I knew I was ever going to teach memoir is that, admittedly, politics has brought a lot of perks, and you know, and and some would say that that we deserve that as being a public figure or whatever. And I never looked at it that way, but by far it's, it's the people that I got to meet through politics. And I'm not just talking about it, famous people because we did, but I'm talking about the people in our neighborhood that we talked about earlier. I'm talking about people that voters that I called. I mean, if, if you're not a, in, involved in politics to the extent we were, you might not be calling voters and hearing about their lives and stuff. So, and just the way it is now, it's it's people, but in a different way that that I've enjoyed um, interfacing with since becoming an author. And you know, if I can help someone else, you know, do what I was able to do, then then I'm happy. Yeah, <laughs> so. and I love the fact that you said it's not about the sign on the front of your yard of your house that identifies you as a person. It's it's who you are, mm -hmm. right? And it doesn't matter who believes what, and if they have a differing opinion. We're still at the end of the day, dog walkers, neighbors, community That's members right. who want to mm -hmm. be there and care for each other. And I think yeah. we can all learn a lesson from your book. And mm -hmm. uh, thank you for writing it. Yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Appreciate your kind words as well. Excellent. So. Everyone, all the information's in the show notes to grab Carrie's book to the website where you can unlock your memoir and grab a free copy of her guide. Everything's there for you. And I would love for you to support Carrie and her community. If you're interested, join the Facebook group as well and meet other amazing authors and, and learn from Carrie one-on-one. -on -one. So again, Carrie, thank you so much for doing this. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being part of Living the Next Chapter. Hey, look at word. We're having such a great time talking to authors around the world. If you are an author and you would like to be on this very show, I would love to talk to you. Livingthenextchapter.com, livingthenextchapter.com, livingthenextchapter.com is the best way to get in touch with us. There you'll find our social media and blah, 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 la di da, and such. You, author, soon to be author, new author, currently writing your book author, published author, we need you here. The seat's empty, microphone set up, we're waiting for you. Livingthenextchapter.com. We would love to have you on the podcast. Yeah, I am talking, I'm talking to you. Yeah, you should be here. We'll see you at livingthenextchapter.com. Hey there, fellow parent. If you're anything like me, balancing screen time for our kids is a constant struggle. That's why I want to share a little secret with you, Kids Pod. It's this amazing app I found that's packed with podcasts just for kids. Imagine stories, learning, and fun all without the screen. 
has been a game changer in our house, keeping my kids engaged and their imaginations running wild. And guess what? It's completely free. So download KidsPod today. Trust me, it's a decision you won't regret.